Yes, we have uh, we have confirmation from somebody in the audience that they could hear us. Right. It's fantastic news. Thank you, Anna. Yeah, and uh, and welcome everybody uh, to this. I think I'm safe in saying the first um, joint seminar between the history and heritage research theme in the School of Modern Languages and the Central and Eastern European Research Group at Cardiff University. Um, this came about from uh, a conversation that Pavel and uh, Duba and I were having not long ago. We have regular chats about Gott und die Welt, as the Germans say, and everything under the sun. And um, Pavel was telling me that he was uh, uh, kind of working up some material on the relationship between uh, Poland and Ukraine, um, which he thought was very relevant to uh, recent events. Um, and I immediately suggested that he should come and speak to us about that. So I'm very pleased that he's been uh, able to, to do that. Just to say a little word about Pavel. He is um, has published many, many publications on uh, Polish politics in the interwar period and Poland's diplomatic history, including a 2013 book on the Polish politician and diplomat uh, Kazimierz uh, Switalski. And um, I know he also has a, a very strong interest in memory politics uh, and in also in cultural diplomacy in the context of Polish history, two interests which originally got us in, in contact. And he's currently working on a book on Polish memory politics in the 20th century. At the same time, as he is a researcher on an AHRC funded project, Post-Socialist Britain, Memory, Representation and Political Identity Amongst German and Polish Immigrants in the UK. So very pleased to have you here, Pavel. Just a word to our audience. There will obviously be time for questions at the end. Um, we are encouraging people to save up those questions until the end, rather than putting them in the chat or the Q&A before we get there, because I think Pavel would find that a little bit distracting. Uh, so uh, when we get to the end, we will be asking you to, to raise your hand or put something in the Q&A. But if you could save the, all of those up until Pavel has finished speaking, that would be much appreciated. So I'll hand over to you and uh, we'll take it from there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, David, for this introduction. And uh, first of all, I'd like to thank you for inviting me to talk about the Polish-Ukrainian relationships in the 20th century and their impact on the present day. This is a subject of great importance, not only for Central and Eastern Europe, which uh, has become an area of tragic historical events, but also for the whole European continent. One can ask why this history of Central and Eastern Europe is so important. Well, I will answer in the following way. We have to remember that the window of history, sorry for this expression, but it's true in this case, if we like it or not, actually likes to blow from east to the west. So knowledge of Central and Eastern Europe, European history is very import, important to, for the Western world either. However, the subject is still a little wrong here. So I'd like to thank Professor Mary Heyman, uh, Dr. Russell Mead, Professor David Clark, and other people who contributed to the organization of this session. And now I will start to share my screen uh, with my uh, little presentation. Uh, so, okay, hopefully it's coming up. Can you see my presentation? Right, so, okay, so I will, I will start. Okay, so, Poland is currently the most active advocate of the Ukrainian cause on the international forum. Uh, it was also the case in times uh, preceding the Russian aggression. How should we explain this fact? After all, not all countries bordering Ukraine have taken such far-reaching measures on its behalf, and Hungary, as we know, openly supports Putin. However, Poland, despite difficult historical experiences in its relationship with Ukrainians, has been trying to support them on their difficult road to the EU and NATO for years. So how can we explain this fact? Should we really see it as a Polish-Ukrainian reconciliation and overcoming of the difficult past? I'll try to provide an answer to this question in my lecture. In order to do it, I'll try, I, I refer to the difficult common history of both nations. The current Polish-Ukrainian relationship uh, are uh, well illustrated by the word recently uttered by Ukrainian President Zelensky. 
on the occasion of the Polish national holiday, the anniversary of the constitution of 3rd May 1791. We have managed to forge an extremely strong alliance that is based on truth and reality, not words and paper. Ukrainian honor and Polish pride. Ukrainian boldness in fight and Polish honesty in helping. It is our greatness and yours. It is a fight for our and your freedom. It is a common history of great nations. These words should be read as an expression of gratefulness for the support of the Polish authorities to the entire society. In this case, I mean not only a large humanitarian aid based on human solidarity with the inhabitants of the neighboring country. Poland's actions are not limited only to the humanitarian aspect, but are manifested through the enormous political support from the Polish government, which is constantly trying to foster its EU partners to tighten anti-Russian sanctions or to shorten the procedures for admitting Ukraine to the European Union. However, the way the Ukrainian president uh, named the Polish-Ukrainian past is a little bit surprising at the first glance. Why? He speaks about the common history of great nations and seems to ignore the tragic dimension of these relationships. As we know, the past is, uh, this past is rich in ethnic cleansing, genocide, and hatred, and was difficult to overcome for decades. As a result, there is a long, long list of mutual grievances on both sides of the Polish-Ukrainian border. This memory of tragic historical events has so far been the main factor casting a long shadow on mutual relationships. Discussions and mutual accusations have now subsided, but they will certainly restart after the end of the war. However, Zelensky's words should uh, show the second dimension of Polish-Ukrainian relationships over the last hundred years, meaning not only war, genocide, or ethnic cleansing, but the mutual understanding and a sense of common, common fate in the shadow of Russia. And the Ukrainian president refers precisely to this tradition in his words. In my lecture, I would like to talk, of course, in a very, believe me, very simplified way about this complex two-dimensional nature of Polish-Ukrainian relations over the past hundred years and explain why their conciliatory nature uttered by Zelensky seems to prevail over prejudices and mutual distrust. It is the key to an understanding of the current policy pursued by Polish political elites toward Ukraine. In order to approach, uh, uh, in order to approach the Polish-Ukrainian relationship in the 20th century, let's get back to aerial times for a while. It is worthwhile to remember that huge areas of today's Ukraine were an integral part of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth as a result of various historical events. After the partitions of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth at the end of the 18th century, some of these lands were seized by Russia and another part of them was seized by, it is assigned to Austria. Ukrainian national consciousness began to develop uh, in these lands along with the acceleration of national building processes uh, of the 19th century. It was a big surprise for the Polish political elite, which intended to rebuild uh, an, an independent Polish state composed, among others, of the lands which were now claimed by the young Ukrainian national movement. These contested areas were inhabited by both the Polish and Ukrainian populations. In this situation, a mutual conflict over these lands, mainly over Eastern Galicia and Volhynia, seemed unavoidable, uh, un unavoidable. And it outbursted at the end of the First World War in 1918. At the, at, at the time, chaos reigned in the vast territories of today's Ukraine and Belarus which both Poles and Ukrainians claim as a part of their own future national state. Both Ukrainians and Poles were also threatened by Bolsheviks and anti-revolutionary forces of General Denikin. In the autumn of 1918, Ukrainian troops tried to capture Lviv, like Ukrainians say, or Lviv in Polish, but encountered the resistance of the Polish self-defense. It was the beginning of the regular war between one of the two newly established Ukrainian states, the West, uh, uh, West Ukrainian People's Republic and Poland. 
this is the this is this country that I show you on the maps. I haven't I haven't found the, the English map for that. So this is in Polish only. So this is this is this uh, West Ukrainian People's Republic. In this Ukrainian People's Republic fought uh, with Poland, and this is uh, this is uh, yeah, this is sorry. Okay. All right, so so uh, the conflict ended up in July 1990 with the defeat of the Ukrainian troops pushed on the territory of the second Ukrainian state, the Ukrainian people, Ukrainian People's Republic, headed by Simon Petrura. And uh, the second Ukrainian state fought against the Poles or, uh, as well, General Donikin and the Bolsheviks. It was a cause at the at the east. The latter. So the Bolsheviks, at the end of the 1990, finally defeated the Ukrainians, who had no choice but to seek an agreement with Poland. Theoretically, the defeat of the Ukrainians created a favorable situation for Poles, allowing them to significant, significantly expand their territory to the east. Although, although some political leaders, mainly from, the, from one of the two largest Polish political camp, right-wing nationalist national democracy, advocated this solution, so the incorporation, just simple incorporation of uh, the Ukrainian lands, they were also afraid of absorbing too much of the non-Polish population. But the head of the Polish state, Józef Piłsudski, the leader of the second most important political camp, was skeptical, though for different reasons, he rightly believed that the chaos reigning in Russia would end one day. As a result, this country would return to its imperial position, trying to regain what it lost during the First World War. Moreover, Poland was a neighbor of Germany in the West, which had lost to Poland the vast territories of Pomerania, Greater Poland, and Silesia. So Germans tried to get them back from the very beginning of the interwar period. In 1918-1990, the state was defeated and weak, I mean Germany, but the situation couldn't last forever. Sooner or later, Germany, and Piłsudski rightly believed, was bound to return to its former imperial position. In this situation, Poland's squeeze between two hostile powers had no chance to survive. How, in his opinion, in the opinion of Piłsudski, could Poland protect itself on the long run? The so-called federalist conception was supposed to be an answer to this question. But what did he mean by federalist conception? And here we get to quite complicated questions that I try to explain in, the, in quite simple words. Piłsudski and his collabor collaborators tried to build a system of independent nation states, which would then form a federation. In this way, he intended to build something that might be called a third force, a counterweight to Russia and Germany in Central and Eastern Europe. This wasn't a new concept. Its genesis reached back to the aerial times. This program was considered, for example, by activists of the Polish Socialist Party in the beginning of the 20th century, so behind, before the First World War. However, in this case, we talk about the theoretical assumptions while Piłsudski, a former socialist himself, was the first to implement them uh, with the use of resources of an independent state. And just another few words uh, about this federalist conception. Uh, this comment to the map that you see on the screen, because this map shows that the federalist conception was also the part of bigger project, I mean intermarum. So there were some projects, for example, to gather together the national states for, uh, of this, uh, as you see, uh, region uh, ranging from uh, the Baltic Sea even to, to the, the Mediterranean and Black Seas. It was a huge uh, theoretical conception of how to overcome this problem of Central and Eastern Europe, so the domination of Russia and Germany. And the federalized project was, I very simplified, but it was the fact that it was a kind, a kind of a part of this uh, project. So as you see, Poland, Poland is a central part of this conception in Termarum. And Ukraine uh, was also a very important part of this conception. So you see that they, both countries uh, are in the central position if we, if we, if we, if we think about 
about inter norm. And this conception, federalist conception, or even this greater, bigger, wider inter norm conception, was seen as a remedium for the domination of Russia and Germany in the Central and Eastern Europe. So Piłsudski, Piłsudski tried to implement this conception. Uh, and what happened next? For this proposal for, to implement this conception of, of, of federalized, conception, this federalized conception, it was necessary to defeat Bolshevik Russia and to push it far to the east, which was a difficult task, as we can imagine. Moreover, the Polish side encountered additional problems from the very beginning. As I have already mentioned, the situation in the East was complicated after all, after the fall of the Tsarist regime. This chaos was followed by acrimonious nationalism, omnipresent violence and hatred. In this situation, it was difficult to convince the local elites of different nations, including Ukrainians, to support far-seeing federal projects. F furthermore, in the case of Belarusians, Bio the existing national movement turned out to be too weak to form the foundations of national statehood. The situation was different in case of Lithuanians. They managed, uh, they managed to build their own state, but they were embroiled in, count in a conflict with Poland over Vilnius in Polish Vilno, which unfortunately poisoned mutual relationship in the entire interwar period. In this situation, Ukraine, which was already prepared to build its state structures, was bound to become a key partner for Poland and its Eastern policy. Although mutual relationships between the two state, two nations were far from idyllic, I, 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 I recall uh, uh, the, both nations fought uh, the bloody war in 1918-1919, but uh, Poles needed Ukraine as much as she needed them. This meant, in turn, that among some of the political elites of pop nations, the idea of joining forces together began to mature. A difficult alliance was born and its consequences are to be felt until today. An agreement was signed between Józef Piłsudski uh, and the aforementioned Ukrainian leader, Simon Petrula, in April 1920. We also recognized the independence of Ukraine both countries also signed a military alliance against Bolshevik Russia. Therefore, Ukrainian units took part in the offensive launch on 25th April by the Polish army. It was a preemptive strike because the military operations on the Polish Bolshevik front were already carried out from the first weeks of 1990. I have no time to dwell in details on the Polish Bolshevik war. Uh, the fight was raging until mid October 1920. On 18 March 1921, the Treaty of Riga was signed. Here you can see Simon Petrula and Piłsudski on the front. It stabilized the situation in Central and Eastern Europe. However, the Treaty of Riga, 18 March 1921. However, it meant that the end of, the end of dreams of an independent Ukraine stayed for decades as Ukraine was eventually divided between Poland and Russia. Therefore, the Polish-Ukrainian alliance did not achieve its goals, and the Second Republic of Poland had to come to terms with Bolshevik Russia, and from 1922, the Soviet Union had to come to terms, so the, this uh, federalist conception failed briefly. However, the federal idea became an important ideological and political heritage. In the Second Republic of Poland, many collaborators of Piłsudski did not approve of the existing geopolitical order. They knew that without an independent Ukraine, the security of Poland and Central Eastern Europe would always be at risk. Hence, they were active in the so-called Promethean movement, based on the assumption that Russia might be ripped, and this is a quotation, at the national seams. In other words, they supported the national anti-communist movements in the Soviet Union and didn't rule out a possible return to federal ideas in the future. The idea of an independent Ukraine constituted, therefore, an important part of the Promethean movement. Its traditions, in turn, of this Promethean movement had a huge impact on the Polish independent political thought after 1945 and the formation of Polish Eastern policy after 1989. I will return to this problem later. But let's get back to the interval period for a while. After the Treaty of Riga, 
millions of Ukrainians found themselves on the one or another side of the Polish-Soviet border. In the areas of two Polish railroad ships, it's something like a county in the UK, they even constituted the majority of the population. Like other national minorities, they had their own representation in the parliament, but they did not influence the formation of the government. Right? They were denied the higher positions in the state administration either. Two, their influence over internal politics was very restrained. This was due to the prevailing role of the right-wing national democracy in Polish politics, this right-wing national democracy that I've mentioned before. This nationalist political camp was an ardent opponent of the federal conceptions of Piłsudski. It resulted in an overtly discriminatory policy, which raised the opposition among the Ukrainians and embittered the already strained relationship with Poles. It also created the fertile ground for acts of violence committed by Ukrainian nationalists. The authorities responded with brutal actions, which resulted in calming down the situation in, East, in the Eastern borderlands. But in the long run, the sense of harm and grievances among the Ukrainian inhabitants has been strengthened. As a result, the hatred against the Polish state was still rising with its outburst during the Second World War. However, we have to remember that in the history of the Second Republic of Poland, not all political groups were guided by nationalist principles. Therefore, we deal also with a more conciliatory internal policy toward Ukrainians, which often coexisted with the policy of colonization and discrimination. Ukrainians could always count uh, on the support of uh, already mentioned Polish Socialist Party, which even submitted, and three times they tried to do it, the bills providing for broad, for broad autonomy to the areas inhabited by Ukrainians. However, these bills were not, never approved by the Polish parliament. Piłsudski, in turn, didn't intend to return to federal ideas. They would have resulted in another war against the Soviet Union. However, he didn't have a clear vision of how Polish-Ukrainian relationships might be within the Polish state. He certainly felt that minorities should not be allowed a far reach of autonomy. But he knew that in the long run, the internal peace and territorial integrity of the Polish state couldn't be guaranteed without the support of national minorities, including Ukrainians. Piłsudski and his people expected them to be loyal to the Polish state. In return, they offered Ukrainians a real opportunity to develop their national life. After the Piłsudski's coup d'etat in 1926 and his takeover of power, they strived to implement these ideas. They granted broad autonomy to the Volyn area, in which the Ukrainians constituted almost 70% of the population, as you can see on the map. In order to gain their support, the Polish administration overtly supported the development of local cultural and social life. Ukrainian organizations and even political parties have been, have been established, and national holidays referring to the idea of the Polish-Ukrainian alliance of 1920 were celebrated exactly here in the Wolin area. This program in Wolin was implemented from 1928 onwards by Henry Guzewski, a former minister in the Petula government and an ardent supporter of Ukrainian independence. However, the pragmatic marshal uh, Piłsudski treated his actions as an experiment. So it always, in, um, many historians say, say about the uh, very experiment. Uh, he wanted to check by this experiment, by this uh, uh, autonomy granted to Volin, uh, whether this autonomy would bring the desired results, which means gaining the support of the local Ukrainian population for the Polish state. And the problem is that if we agree to treat this autonomy like a kind of experiment, one has to admit that this experiment didn't bring the expected results. Finally, the pro ukrainian Yuzevsky was dismissed in 1938, three years after Piłsudski's death. It was a time the polarization became a dominant in the internal, a dominant direction in the internal policy toward national minorities. And even such as the demolition of Eastern Orthodox Ukrainian churches have become the black symbols of, the, of this period. 
In practice, however, this policy of polonization turned out to be counterproductive. It led instead to a deepening of the existing divisions and increased hatred, hatred toward Poles, which exploded with a particular brutality after 1939. And there is no time to dwell on the extremely difficult, complicated, and tragic Polish-Ukrainian relationship during the Second World War. The particularly tragic even uh, in this period was the crime committed by Ukrainian nationalists in Volhynia. So exactly in this region, which was granted the autonomy in, in the interwar period, the same region when Yuzevsky was, uh, was, uh, was in power. So in this region, uh, Ukrainian nationalists uh, committed the crime, and it was it was a crime which is classified now as an ethnic cleansing that resulted in the death of tens of thousands of Poles. This event, which is a symbol of the tragic Polish-Ukrainian past, overshadows mutual relationships until this day. And the result, you, you see the, some photos of the massacres of uh, Poles in Volhynia region, uh, the result of the world, world uh, of the Second World War was tragic for both nations. So Polish, Poles and Ukrainians suffered enormous human losses as a result of hostilities and the policy of extermination carried out in the lands of that Timothy Snyder called Bloodlands. After the end of the war, all, the, all of Ukraine was incorporated into the Soviet Union. Poland, on the other hand, emerged with territorial losses. It lost its eastern confines, including the city of Lvov, uh, the same city for which Poles had fought fierce combats against Ukrainians in 1918. Besides, a totalitarian communist regime was imposed in Poland by Soviet troops. On the other hand, the Polish borders had been shifted to the west, as you see on the map. The borders were cut in the east, and Poland gained some new lands in the West. So these borders were shifted to the West, but there were still centers of the Ukrainian population, uh, of the Ukrainian population on the territory of Poland, and the Ukrainian partisans were still active in this uh, Southeast region of Poland. The severe combat took place in the Bieszczady mountains between Ukrainians and Polish communist security forces. The atrocities were committed by both sides of the conflict. However, this conflict was transferred into a black anti-Ukrainian legend exploited in the communist propaganda until 1989. Uh, the end of the violence was brought about to, uh, by the brutal ethnic cleansing carried out by the Polish authorities, the so-called action Wisła, and uh, the Ukrainian population, it's about 140,000 people, was forcibly dispersed into northern and western areas of Poland. So it was dispersed here, 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 uh, in small groups in order to deal to them in the Polish majority. And uh, uh, in communist Poland, after 1945, there were no room for any Polish-Ukrainian dialogue, not to mention any reconciliation. And I recall, for example, from my primary school, in, uh, from, my, from the Pol Polish Communist Primary School when I was uh, uh, when I was a kid, I remember the, the books, anti-Ukrainian books, for example, when when we we, we read as a it was compulsory lecture for us, so we read these books. Uh, I remember was some of these books uh, until until today. Uh, the atmosphere among the members of the Polish political and military di diaspora in the West, including the Polish authorities in exile based in London, wasn't much better. Although they could not imagine their country with different borders than in 1921, the experience of the last 25 years has shown that Ukrainians would never give up the territories that once belonged to the Second Republic of Poland. It was a dilemma that had to be faced by anyone who intended to take any action for the benefit of Polish-Ukrainian reconciliation. The Polish-Ukrainian relationships after 1945, permitted with uh, violence and genocide, were therefore at in, this, in the lowest possible condition. 
However, and I think for me, it's the most exciting and interesting part of the story uh, uh, of Polish-Ukrainian relationships. However, some people like Jerzy Giedroć and authors uh, who published their texts in his periodical Kultura based in Paris, especially Juliusz Miroszewski, managed to leave the past behind and conceive a realistic political program in order to build the future Polish-Ukrainian relationships on the firm ground. This program was based on the acceptance of the existing political borders and the renunciation of all territorial claims. For Miroshevsky and Giedroj, like for Piłsudski before, good relationships with an independent Ukrainian state were the key aspects of security. So uh, we talk about, about 40s, 50s, when Soviet Union was very strong, but these people, they, they foresee or maybe they 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 they, they foresee the, the 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 breakdown of the Soviet Union and they thought about the future relationships of future Poland and future Ukraine. It's quite 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 extra. It's, it's quite amazing. Thanks to uh, so thanks to that Poland would be separated from Russia. It also meant the stabilization and the security of the whole of Central and Eastern Europe. In other words, Kiedrich and Miroshevsky drew on the federalist but also on the Promethean uh, movement conceptions that, uh, that, uh, that uh, we discussed before in order to overcome the divides of the past and organize this region, I mean the Central and Eastern Europe, on the new geopolitical ground after the collapse of the Soviet Union. Nevertheless, it meant that Lvov might stay on the Ukrainian side of the border. So it was quite difficult to, to accept for many, many people uh, from the immigration circus as well. Although the concessions proposed by Gedroj were painful for many people, really painful. It was, uh, it was they were alone uh, for, 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 for a long time. They gave real hope for the final end of the fratricidal conflict between the two nations, which caused the lives of many people and made it easier for the Soviet Union to consolidate its domination in Central and Eastern Europe. So these ideas gradually made their way into the consciousness of the Polish non-communist elites. Kultura, as a highly influential periodical, became a symbol of this new approach to the relationships with Eastern neighbors of Poland, the so-called EULB countries, this expression taken from one of Miroszewski's articles. So these ULB countries, it means Lithuania, Belarus, and Ukraine. Smuggled into the communist country, Kultura was eagerly read by the opposition circles in which these ideas were discussed and commented. The conceptions promoted in Kultura prevailed with time and from the mid seventies, approximately, we can talk about something that historians call the doctrine of Kiedroj or Giedroj or, or, or a doctrine of Giedroj Miroszewski. To use the post-solidarity elites entered the period of the political changes after 1989, marked as we know by the gradual breakdown of the Soviet Union, with a clear political program. Independent Ukraine was therefore seen as an important partner which might be supported in his effort to become a member of the European Union and NATO. And it's not a coincidence that Poland was the first country to recognize the independence of Ukraine on the 2nd December 1991. Although internally divided, Ukraine started its gradual rapprochement with Poland and Western institutions. A lot of the key importance of this country for the stability of the whole region, Moscow tried to sabotage this process, eventually resorting to confrontation in 2014 and now. It led to the detachment of Crimea, Crimea, Crimean Peninsula, and then Russia carried out in the, the open aggression that we witness nowadays. And this, in, in conclusion, I, I'd like to say a few words and to, about, about all, of, all, all this subject. Ukraine is a key country for Poland, as we see. Uh, and its independence is seen in Warsaw as a crucial element in the jigsaw called the geopolitical security of Central and Eastern Europe. But independent Ukraine is not enough. According to the federalist and Promethean conceptions discussed before, 
the task is not is, is to build a system of independent countries that are also friendly to Poland. So not only independent countries, but uh, but friendly countries. Uh, so the existence of an independent but also friendly Ukraine was the main purpose of the part of Polish elites from Piłsudski onward. Uh, part of Polish elite, because as I said, part of Polish elites completely disagreed with Piłsudski. We have to remember that. In this case, the reconciliation between Poland and Ukraine is important not only from the moral and of course human, but also from a political point of view. And in order to reconcile, both nations have to overcome their painful past. This process is ongoing for a long time, and the Russian aggression that we witnessed only accelerated this process. It does not mean that we won't see any controversies around this, some historical issues. The clue is that the combination of geopolitical factors and the deliberate work of many people like Giedroć or Miroshevsky, but also many others, created favorable conditions for the rapprochement repro between the two nations that we can see right now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pavel, for a really interesting talk and a great sketch um, of overview. I just wondered if um, anyone has any questions just yet, or if you need a moment to think. And could, we, could I please ask for people not to use the chat function, if they don't mind, just to either raise their real hand or their virtual hand, if that's possible. Um, while people are gathering their thoughts, I had one just quick question for you, Pavel, which was just um, to ask about the immediate reaction to the uh, Russian invasion uh, in February. And just wondering if you found that the reaction was uh, more populist or whether, you know, did, did the Polish government follow uh, a more local spontaneous reaction on the ground or do you think the government was quick to respond? Well, it's very it's very good question, and it's very difficult to say with a certain with a certain. Uh, uh, you know, when we when we uh, look at this problem from this broader historical perspective, uh, and and we look at the problem and at, at, at this conception uh, that we call uh, uh, the Giedroj doctrine of Giedroj of Miroszewski Giedroj, which is really really the main doctrine in Polish, Polish Eastern policy for 30 years. Uh, I think I think Polish Polish government, it was quite a natural reaction for us, you know, because uh, we know and Polish government knows it, and it's not only the government which is in, govern, uh, in, in power right now in Poland, I mean, law and justice government, but all other governments more or less know knows uh, the same that for us independent ukraine is our uh, to be or not to be uh, and uh, this is you know this is why uh, if we if we if you look at the media for example if you look for all the reaction of some western politicians for example there is a, a there is a very very exciting uh, interview with Pol with a former uh, american ambassador in uh, in in poland and she was always against law and justice, but she said that the law and the Polish government was, was, has, has, was were right, uh, being always anti-Russian, always saying that Putin is dangerous. And and uh, because it's, uh, I think I think I think it was it was a kind of um, a kind of main uh, thread in Polish policy for thirty years. So we were anti, we were very suspicious of Russia, and we are we are we are trying to support Ukraine in their uh, way to independence, then in their way to NATO and European Union. So I think if we look at the Polish reaction uh, after the after, sorry, sorry, the Russian aggression against Ukraine, I think it's, it was quite natural for us uh, that it's, uh, we had to support Ukraine. And it was, it, was, um, it was evident for all political forces. If, if, you, if, you, if you see the reaction of Polish political forces, for example, there is no difference. You know. Uh, you see uh, a civic platform, you see uh, law and justice, you know, uh, people who are fighting together, you know, all the time in internal politics, very brutal internal politics sometimes, you know. After the, after the aggression uh, against Ukraine, this, all these discussions in internal politics, you know, stopped. And, and there was a huge national consensus that uh, even, I was really surprised. I was really surprised when I heard. I was. It was. Uh, I think a week or two ago. 
I, I've seen the information that the chief of civic platform praised our prime minister, Mateusz Morawiecki. You know, in Polish internal politics is something which is incredible, you know? So it means that this is really something which was quite natural for us. And yeah, this, this Polish reaction, I think was quite natural. Thank you. Does anyone have a question or comments? Um, it's a small group, so you know it could be more of a conversation, if you like, than uh, than just questions. If anyone has anything they want to say, I think a hand is raised there. Tatiana is got somebody let her speak. Tatiana. Uh... Yeah, I could just um, allow her to talk. Oh. <laughs> I think I may yes. have done that. Okay. Hello. Okay. Hi. Uh, can you hear me? Okay. Can you can you yes. hear me now? Yes. yes. Thank you. Um, uh, thank you, Pavel, for for this insightful lecture, um, which made me think about what actually divides and what reconciles the nations. And one of the key messages that I have taken from your lecture is that the tragic nature of some events from the past can indeed divide the nations for decades or even for centuries. But what can reconcile them is the vision of the future. And um, this is also this also explains why it doesn't work for Russia and Ukraine, because we observe in Russia this fixation, obsession with the past, and it looks that Russia's vision of the future is in the past. Yes. And in this vision of great Russian empire, uh, there is no place for independent, successful, democratic, friendly uh, Ukraine, which is also part of European Union, for instance, because within this Russian imperial thinking um, and the narrative of the Russian world with three Slavic nations, Kiev is the center of Kievan Jews, is kind of spiritual Jerusalem for the Russian world and for Russian empire. Without Kiev, the whole vision and the ideological legitimacy of this narrative would be missing. So the whole construct would be collapsing then. So Russian elites and intellectuals didn't articulate, as Pilsudski did, any other vision of Russia's future which would be more, more appealing than this anachronistic, rudimental vision uh, concept or concept of the, of the great Russia with Kyiv in, in the middle of it. So yes. we see the opposite with Poland in Ukraine. And, and as Pavel showed it in this lecture, that Poland, for Poland, this independent, successful, democratic, and friendly Ukraine is, is vital part of, uh, of Poland's vision of their own future. Um, and I, um, I really hope also that um, this, um, uh, basically, I'm, um, I, I, would, I, I would like to make now another point as well, if, if, if I may, if we, if we have time for this. Um, I was thinking that probably this collaboration, close uh, co cooperation of Poland and Ukraine in the future, also in the realm of the politics of history, that it, it has much potential to shift the Western historical narrative. For instance, uh, in, in, with regard to the Second World War, because um, the current war in Ukraine shows very much how problematic this narrative is. In the rhetoric of most German politicians and journalists, which is so, so much focused on guilt and historical responsibility towards Russia, Ukraine and Poland are often absent, despite the fact that Ukrainians and Poles were in the middle of all Hitler's projects of colonia colonization and enslavement, such mm -hmm. as Hunger Plan, the General Plan OST, and the Final Solution. All these projects were focused directly, primarily on Ukraine and Poland. And all of the Soviet Ukraine and Poland were occupied during the war, but only 5% of the so of Soviet Russia. So I hope that this um, the work of Polish Ukrainian historians in the future and politicians as well could also be beneficial for shifting this perspective in Germany first of all and to to re to, to let Poland well, less Poland but more Ukraine reemerge on this mental map of the of, of German politicians. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it's true. Thank you for 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 for, for, uh, for this point and for raising this point of political history as well. Because it's true. I think I think Russians are enslaved in their own political history, and uh, I think this is a huge problem of this country that they are uh, the very. You know, it's quite it's quite it's quite it's quite strange sometimes for me because I was thinking about Polish uh, nation sometimes that we are we are very very we are looking backwards sometimes uh, very often. But it's true, but but but. It's, but I think this Polish-Ukrainian relationship show that we really can overcome this past. And there are, there are the part of elite schools always, you know, looking at the future and the cooperation between people and not, not, not the divides. And, you know, we don't, we, we can't really imagine what, how difficult it was for Polish uh, 
exile community here in, in the UK, for example, to overcome uh, this uh, divide. Because for them, for now, for my generation, the fact that Lvov is Ukrainian, uh, uh, Ukrainian city is completely normal. And nobody, uh, no, nobody, uh, nobody normal, really nobody normal, uh, mentally normal in Poland would suggest that Poland should get uh, Lvov back. It is completely ridiculous for everybody in Poland. So it's completely normal. But in 1945, in, in, in 50s, even in 60s, for the Polish community here in the UK, it was it was really difficult to 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 to, to get to 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 to, to, to admit that Lvov should be Ukrainian now, and you should uh, stick to the borders that you have right now. So it was really because we we, we sometimes we don't really uh, uh, we don't really uh, we have to remember that a lot of people here in the UK was from the eastern confines of Poland. So a lot, really a lot of people, a lot of soldiers, politicians were from were from Eastern Conference and not only from the roof, but many, many other places in, in Eastern Conference of Poland that were uh, that were that Poland lasts forever. And for this generation, it was very, very difficult. So this is why Giedroj and Miroszewski was so Giedroj, who was born in Minsk. So he was also from Eastern Conference. Giedroj, Jerzy Giedroj, but but for him. The future was the most important thing, and he he was thinking uh, in in the geopolitical categories, and and he he understood that we that Polish Ukrainian uh, conflict is is uh, it's something which Russia is the main uh, the main profiter. It, Russia profits from Polish Ukrainian uh, conflict, and he understood this problem, and he this is why this concept was so bold in this time. And it was so important. And for me, it's it's the uh, the influence of uh, Kultura, the influence of Gedroj is so is so so amazing. And I think the story is so amazing that this conception could uh, could uh, prevail. And now we see the support of Poland for independent Ukraine. Thank you. Would anyone else like to ask or comment? Uh, Samuel? Hi, thank you. And thank you, Pavel, for that talk. I did have one question. Um, when you're talking about the sort of black legend, the mutual black legend between Poland and Ukraine after 1945, and your own experience of um, being in primary school and seeing very anti-Ukrainian work, and my question was to do with whether there was any sort of Soviet oversight of that from Moscow. I would have thought kind of the first thing that came to mind was would the Soviets have, have wanted that to happen, given they presumably wanted a degree of cohesion between the Warsaw Pact states or, you know, what was the sort of Soviet reaction to that? Were they happy to let that happen or were they in some way trying to sort of hold that mutual hatred well, back? You know, thank you. It's a very, very good question. Uh, and uh, and I think both, uh, both of them, I mean, uh, first of all, uh, you know, for Soviet, it was absolutely uh, important to 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 uh, to keep this uh, to keep this anti-Ukrainian uh, this Ukrainian propaganda in Poland. But we have it's more complicated because we have to uh, we have to remember that, for example, uh, for the Polish communist elites, uh, a lot of them fought in Bieszczady, in Bieszczady mountains, and uh, there are some historians that even say that for this generation of, for example, General Jaruzelski uh, or General Kishchak or uh, people uh, in power in uh, the most important persons in, in, in communist Poland, it was a kind of generational experience for them to fight against Ukrainians. And uh, so, so for them, this anti-Ukrainian uh, propaganda, it was, I think it was not only Ukrainian, it was not only propaganda for them, it was something more. They were really anti-Ukrainian because they fought against Ukrainians in Bieszczady. And I remember, for example, uh, when I talk about my private experience of this of this uh, period, I was in the primary school, and until this day, it was very good written. Really, I remember the book, which was written. I don't remember the author, but I remember the I remember the title. It was Shadrish Pazurov. Please don't try me to, 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 to translate in English right now, <laughs> but it was it was very, very good written and it was about the about the about the fight against Ukrainians in in in, in Bieszczady Mountains, and I remember when I was a kid the the symbol UPA Ukrainska Armia Powstańcza U U P A, so the symbol of organization of Ukrainian uh, Ukrainian nationalists 
was something like you know like SS or like 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 Gestapo or something like that. Really, we Ukrainians were presented as 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 you know uh, killing people, children, uh, well, uh, children, uh, women, you know, burning the villages and so on and so on. They were they were presented in this book as very cruel people. And Polish communist forces were presented as, you know, fighting for independence, for freedom, against murderers, really, against, it, it was presented like that, you know, really. And I remember when I was a kid, I, I like this book, you know, and I, when I think about this right now, you know, it, 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 it's, 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 it's uh, I feel really, it, it's, you know, it's, it's disastrous, but this book was really well written and this propaganda, you know, was deliberately conducted by communist uh, regimes in Poland. Uh, and it was more than propaganda, I think, for them. It was really something they believed in. Thank you very much. Cheers. Anyone else? <laughs> David? Yeah, just a quick question, because uh, what I found fascinating about your talk um, is the extent to which this this offers kind of a very different perspective on some of Poland's behaviour during the, the the current Ukraine crisis uh, to what we quite often see in the in the British media, particularly in the kind of I guess liberal left media, where there's quite often a, a concentration on um, you know Poland's previously uh, a kind of very um restrictive attitude to to immigration and not wanting to be part of the european immigration system and that being then contrasted with its willingness to host ukrainian refugees at the same time as it's securing its border with belarus where we know because of the non-european refugees that are coming in through that route so i've i've certainly read a lot of commentary that 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 portrays the reaction of the of, of the law and justice government to Ukrainian refugees coming into Poland as, as being kind of coloured implicitly by sort of a kind of hypocrisy, if you like, uh, that's to do with you know racialization of different groups of, of refugees. Um, and I don't think that's necessarily completely untrue. I mean, I, you know, I think there is a desire in Poland not to have refugees from outside of, uh, of Europe coming into Poland, at least on the part of the government. Um, but do you think that says something about how the British media or the Western media perceive Poland and its attitude to its neighbours, because the perspective that you're offering is really quite different in a way, saying that the friendship towards, you know, you wanting to support Ukraine has to do with Poland's perception of its own security needs and its historic place in Europe and that those kind of issues around, uh, you know, race, I guess, that are being programmed in the, in the British media, I think, that, that they're maybe less important or that they're part of a more complex mix i guess is what i'm saying uh, if i understand well your question david i think it's quite complicated because um uh i think absolutely polish society i mean polish government let's maybe say like that because i i don't i, I don't want to, to say on behalf of polish society which is 38 million of people very very you know with very many many diverse you know uh political view on on, 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 on things it's it's i think that i think that uh i i would i would stick to this uh, to this interpretation uh, of uh, security needs but the first of all maybe maybe i would start from another another uh, uh, first of all you've got this humanitarian uh, aspect of all that so i mean that that poland uh, the polish society is willing to help because uh, we've got the huge humanitarian need and we've got the huge humanitarian uh, humanitarian crisis uh, uh, in the East, and Polish society is just willing to help. I know that in 2015, uh, Polish government wasn't willing to take uh, any other refugees, uh, no refugees at all. I know that uh, we've, we've seen this crisis, refugee crisis on the Polish uh, border, but I think I would stick really to these humanitarian reasons of the Polish uh, Polish uh, society. Uh, I think this humanitarian reason is combined with this, <clears throat> sorry, security reasons as well, because it's true that for us Ukrainians are more. We know these people, you know, there are people from the neighborhood, you know, from the neighboring country. 
there are a lot of there are a lot of Ukrainians before the war in Poland. I think million or two millions of Ukrainians uh, really uh, before the second before the before the <clears throat> Russian aggression. So Ukrainians were already in Poland, and there were uh, people were acquainted with these Ukrainians. And so yes, this this uh, option is also important here. But there is also I think this the so humanitarian option, historical, um, uh, uh, geopolitical reason. But I think there is also another reason that I'd like to mention here. I mean, uh, and I don't want, I don't want to to enter into the deta details here, but because it's still uh, quite 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 blurred for all of us because we have to see the sources and so on. But but uh, Polish government accuses Belarusian government, I think, rightly that they play with refugees. I mean, they they play the game, and I know they. They, they they deliberately create the crisis uh, uh, to to push more refugees towards the European Union, and from one side, and from one side it was quite inhuman. I I, I completely agree uh, that it was inhuman to keep these people on the border. But on the other side, uh, Polish authorities uh, feared that uh, that uh, if we if we Take refugees, uh, Belarus will push, push more and more refugees uh, on our border. So it was like a kind of uh, very vicious game, which is, from my point of view, was 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 really really uh, was was really. I can find the word right now, but it was uh, disgusting for me. Maybe I'd say like that, but. Uh, yes, I agree that this politics towards, uh, towards other refugees isn't uh, isn't something that we can proud to be proud of in Poland. I absolutely agree, but we have to remember about this 2.5 millions of Ukrainians, which or more, I think now, which uh, who are admitted to Poland. So I think we have to be really very very careful when we accuse this Polish government. Uh, and I think that Western media are a little bit one-sided in this, and I I I think that we have to present the whole picture, uh, which is sometimes very, very complicated, very complex, and we sometimes don't like to present the whole picture. We, we prefer sometimes to, to choose one or two elements from our, from our, from our, um, from, uh, from this picture and to present it as the prevailing, uh, as the most important element. But I think we have to present the whole picture of the story, and this whole picture is very, very, very complicated, very complex. And I think we don't. We really have to know something about this Polish Polish Ukrainian relationships, uh, very difficult relationships, but very important to really uh, comprehend the policy which is uh, pursued by Polish government right now. I think. If it helps, David. Uh, if it's your question. Hey, thank you. Yeah, yeah. I think that's what I was was driving at more than more than to say. <laughs> so uh, just for, for clarity, I wasn't really sort of. Uh, you know what Poland's done in terms of putting Ukraine has been absolutely uh, amazing. I guess my my point was more on that last thing that you were saying that that the Western media isn't kind of taking account of the complexity of of the reasons That's for it. the way that mm -hmm. Poland's reacted, and I think that your talk has added an important uh, an important perspective to help us understand that some of that complexity. Does anyone else have a question? If not, I ha was wondering something. Does anyone have a question or comment? Um, I'm just wondering what what you or others in the group uh, think the solution is supposed to be, because um, you know we do have this this history of the bloodland, so to speak. We you know the the instability of borders and the repeated challenging of those borders, um, rival and opposing histories and memory politics. Where where does it go from here? Where's this? What's the solution? I don't expect you to, you know, have the answers. I wonder if the group generally, if there are people who want to speak to that. But what do you mean by the word solution? Well, um, how do you reach this lovely ideal of balanced uh, states that don't invade each other's borders? Um, you know, this has been a repeated problem, right? You know, you know, I think sometimes that we, 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 I'm a historian. But I have to say that we sometimes we talk too much about history. Sorry for that. But I have to say it. Maybe this is this is a problem sometimes for us. And I think I think you know if I if I understood well your your question your 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 point here that this is you know from the from the Polish perspective there is no problem with that. So you know uh, 
Poland was always aware of its uh, um, feebleness. I think this is a kind of word. So we were we, we always perceived this, uh, 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 us as a feeble country after 1918. Piłsudski perceived Poland as a very feeble country. So he didn't want to launch any other war against Soviet Russia. And for example, uh, Russians were always very suspicious of Polish uh, Polish uh, government in interwar period. They always were suspicious of Piłsudski, but Piłsudski was very realistic, and he didn't want to to, to fight another to fight another war. You know, Poland right in, in uh, 2022 uh, is is aware of its uh, feeble position as well. You know, we are in the European Union, we are in the in NATO, but we know that we are economically. Uh, Economically, military Poland has very restrained uh, possibilities, and we, you know, the, but the problem is with Russia, who stick stick to its past, its imperial past, and it's uh, you know, I think Poland. What, what I want to say that Poland was 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 has imperial position in in Eastern Europe as well. You know, Poland, Jagiellonian Poland uh, from 15, 15, 7, uh, mm, 15th, uh, 17th century was 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 the country which was the biggest country in Europe after I think uh, Turkey and I think after Turkey was uh, the surface of Poland was the, was the biggest uh, Polish uh, Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth was the biggest uh, country in Europe but you know so Poland was in Peri was was has this imperial past as well but I think we could uh, overcome this imperial past as well so as I say. There is no, I don't know any, any uh, there is there are no people mentally uh, have uh, with the mental with the, with the, uh, mentally uh, responsible people in Poland who would say that, for example, Wolf Vilno should should be uh, should be taken back because this is uh, we, we overcome this past. But the problem is that Russia didn't do it, and the Russia still they had still imperial imperial uh, imperial uh, thoughts in their head and we can only we can only we can only expect that Russia will change one day I and mean, maybe it's naive I think but even Gedroch and Miroshevsky they they didn't ex they didn't want to exclude Russia they they believe that Russia could change one day and that the Russia could overcome its imperial past as well so I think we maybe we have to as one 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 uh, as somebody said before that we have to think about the future not about the past i think maybe it's naive but i think we, we have no other choice here does anyone have a question or a comment or I mean, if not, I think we can just um, once again thank our speaker very much for for a very interesting talk. And uh, there's um, David. Is there anything you'd like to say to wrap up? No, just to say thank you, Pavel, for for bringing to bear a really fascinating historical perspective on on current events, which uh, you know I'm sure I and uh, the rest of the audience have found very enlightening. So thank you again. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you.